Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fourth floor lecture of Professor Lees. Once more, Professor Lees Tippett, thank you very much for coming. And it's up to you. Bom dia. So I understand this is very cold in Brazil. <laughs> this is very nice by American standards. It's very comfortable. So thank you for bringing me nice American weather. <laughs> I am enjoying this nice weather very much. <laughs> so um, I thought today that we could talk about negotiation theory um, and practice primarily through the lens of talking about how um, I've been teaching negotiation these days. Um, so when we were giving the um, talk to the court last week, the federal federal judges, federal judges, one uh, uh, judge, uh, Bruno Takahashi said, do you still use getting to yes in your class? And the answer is yes. And um, Professors still use it to varying degrees, but um, I still use it, but it is not the central focus of my class. Um, getting to yes is one of many tools that I offer the students, and my class is structured around offering students different tools that they can use so that they can choose what they need to focus on and how they personally want to improve, and then they choose which tools are best suited to helping them get better. Everybody's familiar with uh, getting to ask probably most of them, but some of them are not. Oh, everybody? Everybody? yeah. Um, so what I thought I would do is talk about how I structure the concepts in my course. And, and my course is actually organized around students doing simulations. So you give them a fact pattern and then they negotiate. They take on a role and then negotiate in that role. But they, they, um, they tape their negotiations on their laptop. They record it on their laptop. And what my students are required to do at the end of the term is make a video montage of their skill progression over the term. So remember, like, is, is that movie Rocky famous in Brazil about the boxer? You know, where, and then there's this montage where he's like training and fighting and getting stronger and stronger. And by the end, he's like super strong. And I actually haven't seen the movie, so I don't know how it ends. But, um, you know, so, so the students make like a Rocky style montage of how their skill was at the beginning of the course and the various tools and competencies they've developed over the course. And that ideally they're showing some clips from the end of the course where they're really brilliant and skillful and masterful at whatever skill they have chosen to focus on. And I'll talk about the different um, skills that students typically choose um, to work on. Although sometimes students decide they wanna work on something different and that's okay too. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about why I like this approach better than just teaching getting to yes um, as the central focus of the course. Um, I should also say that um, ADR scholars in the United States who teach negotiation are very interested and engaged in teaching methods and trying new teaching methods and um, seeing how they work. So there's actually quite a variety of teaching methods in the United States in the negotiation context. Um, so this approach isn't necessarily the one that everybody uses. People use all sorts of different things. It used to be more uniform and I'll explain that in a minute too. Any questions? Not yet, okay. So these are like the big three books that are most commonly assigned um, in the United States in negotiation courses. Um, the central book uh, for many decades has always been Getting to Yes, and it's still a central book. There's also another book by, written by Robert Mnookin, and I mentioned him later, called Beyond Winning. Um, Beyond winning is useful because it presents negotiation skills within the context of lawyering. So they talk, he talks about how lawyers use negotiation skills. And so his tools are centered around what he calls the three tensions. One of the tensions is empathy and assertiveness. And I'll talk about that later. Um, one of them is 
the principal agent tension, which is that um, lawyers sometimes have different incentives from their clients. And I don't remember the third tension. I guess I don't really teach that one. In the United States, three is a very lucky number. So scholars always organize and say, we have three things, even if they don't need three things and only two of the things are useful. Um, so I don't remember what his third thing was, but whatever. I think it's at the end of the book. I don't really assign it. I'm sorry, Bob, if you're watching, he's not watching. Okay. Um, and then the other book that is very commonly used in, uh, in negotiation classes is the other book called Difficult Conversations. Um, and and these, these the folks that wrote this book are also from Harvard. These all three books are from Harvard. So this is sort of used, reviewed as the Harvard model. Um, the Difficult Conversations is, is structured around the three conversations. Again, everyone wants to put three. I'll, I don't know if I remember all three of them. Uh, I, no, I do remember all three of them. So one of the so the purpose of the Difficult Conversations book is to essentially fill in a gap in the getting to yes model. So the getting to yes model is very um, substance focused. So it's it's a, it's a book about problem solving and how you can get a good substantive outcome that is fair, where you can persuade the other side to adopt a good substantive outcome. And one of the critiques that getting to yes has faced is that it doesn't really help address interpersonal disputes where the problem is other people or that you feel like the problem is other people or the problem is feelings or a, a bad interpersonal dynamic. It doesn't really address that. And so the difficult conversations book is really intended to fill that gap. So, um, so the first conversation they describe, they, they basically say every conversation is actually three conversations. So it has three, that these, these difficult conversations that are very fraught and very emotional, it's because there's a, there's a subtext to those conversations. So one of the subtexts that they say is embedded in these fraught, these fraught conversations is the what happened conversation. And that is the idea that we, we fight over the narrative over what happened, especially when something goes wrong and that we tend to blame each other. And so their argument is that instead of blaming each other, you should talk about how each of you contributed to the problem. So, you know, if the boss says you screwed up that project, the, the employee might say, well, I didn't screw up the project. Like you gave me bad instructions. And so it's your fault. And then we, they argue about who's to blame. And they say that instead you should shift to talking about how each of you contributed to the situation. So the boss will admit the instructions weren't great, but the employee will admit that they did a lousy job or turned it in late. You, um, you can see I'm a little bit, uh, you know, sarcastic in the way I describe this because I think we've discovered over time that this doesn't fix every problem. You know, and this is um, this is something that happens in American ADR cultures. You get a new book and everyone's really excited and they have this sort of you know religious experience. This book's this book changed my life, so people have this feeling about getting to yes. And the same thing with difficult conversations. Oh, this book changed all my bad conversations into new into extremely great conversations that changed my life. You must read this book. Um, and I have a story to go with that in just a minute. But um, the other converse, the other implicit conversation they describe in this book is the feelings conversation, your emotions about the conversation. And so they they argue that the solution to this problem is that you should discuss your emotions. You should discuss your emotions um, with the other side to each other. However, <laughs> and this is a very famous business book actually. But what they say is, and especially in professional contexts, when they say what well, you should say, you should talk about your feelings in a very unemotional way. <laughs> so what they say is you should say, well, I want you to know, I feel very hurt by what you said. But, but even though you're talking about your feelings, you're saying it in a very flat affect. And apparently that is supposed to make it better. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, you can see how these ideas get a little bit contorted over time when you try and put them into practice. Um, the, and then the last implicit conversation they say that you, you have in a difficult situation is the identity conversation. And the identity conversation is the idea that one of the reasons these are hard is because these difficult topics say something about who you are and how you see yourself. So um, you know, if you're having a conversation with your employee and you say to the employee, you did a bad job, 
it, one of the reasons this is a hard conversation is you, the boss, are thinking to yourself, oh, maybe this is my fault. I'm a terrible boss. I've always been a terrible boss. I've been, I'm a terrible family member. Everything about me is terrible. <laughs> and that this, this dialogue that you have in your head is preventing you from dealing with the other person in front of you. And so they argue that you should negotiate with yourself and off the cliff and that you should say, you know, you should tell yourself, you know, it's not all, all bad. You know, sometimes maybe you're a good boss. Sometimes you're a bad boss. Everybody's a little bit good and a little bit bad. And so we should have this conversation with ourselves in order to have a better conversation with the other person. Okay. So that is, that is the theory that um, difficult conversations brings to the negotiation pantheon. So I, I actually used to work for the people who wrote this book, which is my, maybe why I'm a little bit cynical. So, so they also are like Roger Fisher in that they feel that sometimes people have taken their book a little bit too seriously. So one of the, one of the things they told me was that, you know, people think that if they read this book, all of their difficult conversations will go away and their life will be changed. Um, but what they said is that is not at all true. What they said is the purpose of the book is that it is intended to make your difficult conversations slightly less terrible. <laughs> but the people don't understand that the goal of this book is to make this tiny little change and not like change your whole life. Well, I mean, I think they're, you know, they're regular people. So they are also like the rest of us, extremely bad at handling difficult conversations. So they realize there are limits to these things. So, <clears throat> All right, so that is like the pantheon of, oh, question, yes. <laughs> yes. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm <laughs> Okay, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for taking the magic out of this book. I well, let me also say something which is making me extra cynical, which is when you are a professor, what happens is every time you teach a class, you're starting from scratch, and you and the students are not familiar with the material, and so they start at a certain negotiation level, and then you get them up to a next level, and then they leave, and then you start over again. It is like this movie Groundhog Day. There's a, there's a famous movie in the United States called Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, where every day he wakes up and it's the same day. It's Groundhog Day over and over. And his life doesn't change. He has to live the same day again and again. So this is what it feels like to be a professor is because you're doing this. And so to the professor's point of view, you feel like you never get anything done because the moment you get your students up to a certain level, you're back at the fresh start. And so I think there's a little bit of cynicism associated with being a professor because you feel like you actually never accomplish anything. So I think maybe that's part of it. So if, if it, the book changed your life, then I'm happy for you. <laughs> and I believe you, I believe you that it, that it made a difference. Um, okay. So, um, these books are very helpful and the tools are very useful and I continue to assign these books in my class and I continue to teach these topics. Um, but the, I also discovered that there are pedagogical limits. So pedagog, are you familiar with this term pedagogical? Yeah, there are pedagogical limits to using the exclusively these tools for teaching negotiation. And I'm going to explain why. Okay, so, so first, I just want to explain what all these three books have in common, the sort of general worldview that these books present which is to negotiate about interests instead of underlying positions. I'm sure this is familiar. The idea that you should create value and find joint gains rather than just distribute value. Oh, that was the other tension from Manukin's book, sorry. The tension between creating and distributing value. Um, the idea that you should listen to what the other side has to say and listen in a way that, so they, they understand your point, that, that they listen in a way that they know that you are listening. So not just listen, but demonstrate you are listening. Uh, they are very focused on fairness rather than winning. Um, they are focused on building long-term relationships. And of course, these, this model is centered around the seven elements of negotiation. And this may be familiar to you also. So the seven, so the seven elements, seven is the other lucky number. So in American culture, seven and three. So the three, <laughs> seven elements. So these are the seven elements. Um, and, and we teach these actually very commonly. So 
Alternatives, you know, you, which you, is maybe the most important one, which is understanding what is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. BATNA, this is probably familiar from getting to yes. Interest, what are your underlying concerns? Options, what are the different ways we could resolve this? Criteria is what are the principles of fairness that might govern um, how we resolve this? For example, the law or like the third party market value. Relationship with the other side. Commitment, meaning how strong of a commitment are we gonna sign an agreement? Are we gonna have an agreement in principle? Are we just going to agree to talk about this later? And communication, how well am I conveying my information to the other side? How well are they conveying information to me? So those are the, ba those, those are the basic principles of the Harvard model. Questions about that? Okay. The Harvard model that is widely diffused within the American um, law schools is also a teaching model that has been developed sort of over time um, as a matter of practice that has diffused in, within the um, academic culture. So here's the teaching model that is, is commonly used at Harvard and that others have adopted. So at Harvard, they teach um, the, the negotiation classes by American standards very large. So the Harvard uh, class is like 120 people, which for in the US standard would be a very large class. I understand it's a little bit different here. So what happens is there will be an instructor who gets up at the front of the room, just like here, will give a lecture, just like I'm doing right now. Then they would break up into smaller groups of maybe 24 and they would do a negotiation simulation. Do you teach using simulation models? Yeah, so role play. role play, yeah. So role play, you give each side an instruction and then they negotiate. And then afterwards they're supposed to reflect on their experiences. So usually they do this in like a smaller group of 24 with an instructor who will help them process and think about their experiences. Um, and then maybe they, for their final assignment, they might um, provide a series of reflection papers that reflect on how well they did. But, um, and so um, when I was working there, you know, I, I worked as a teaching assistant for a number of years, um, sort of observing, participating in when I was a student and then observing the model. And I did come to feel like there were some limitations to the model, which, um, are really well articulated in an article by Andrea Cooper Schneider. I will, where is her citation? Uh, it's, it was in the, um, no, it was in the um, materials. Oh, here's the name of her article. Uh, so this is the scholar, her name is Andrea Cooper Schneider right here. And she wrote a, a really wonderful article called Teaching a New Negotiation Skills Paradigm. This is the name of her article. And it's available on the internet for download anytime. And so this is the model that I use. And I think one of the reasons I found it compelling was that I was persuaded by her um, views of the pedagogical limits. Uh, Andrew Cooper Schneider is on this slide. Andrew Cooper Schneider. Um, okay, so one of the things that, that you notice over the course of teaching students is that the Harvard model places a lot of value on cooperation and empathy, and that is important. But what happens is some students already start out in the course with an assertive bargaining style, where they are very good at having a distributive argument, they're very good at claiming value and getting a good outcome they want, they are very good at arguing their case. And what happens when you teach only the um, Fisher model is these students might think this is great, this changes my life, this is gonna change how I do it. But these students also notice there is an implicit value judgment in the getting to yes model that suggests that the way they are doing it is wrong or bad. And, and students who, who start out with an assertive bargaining model resist the Fisher model because they feel that it is judging them as being bad at negotiation. And so the students who might need to work the most on listening and cooperation and empathy actually have the strongest angry adverse reaction to the Fisher model and then get the least out of the course. So one of the reasons I like Andrea's model is it allows students to decide what they wanna work on and how they wanna improve and what they wanna do better at 
rather than us telling them you're implicitly telling them the way you're doing it is wrong. Do the, do the, do it this other way. When these students have a lifetime of actual experience where they know from their life that their style worked really well for them. And so they don't really believe you when you tell that, when you tell them this is a better way because their way works pretty well. They're also aware of the limits, but so the, so these, so part of what ends up happening with students who are assertive is you get in this sort of dynamic in the course where they're constantly questioning, constantly resisting the Fisher model. And they don't really believe you when you say, well, you know, you don't have to do it this way. They don't believe you because the whole course is around or organized around being cooperative. Um, the other thing is that you also have the opposite problem with students who are timid, who are not very assertive because the implicit message you are sending those students in the course is that the way they do, the way they bargain is, is good, or at least ethically good. If it's not effective, you should feel good about yourself that you're very good at listening. And so these students might feel kind of complacent and might not actually be that motivated to improve and may not have a very good pathway to become more assertive and better at bargaining because we're sending them the implicit message that their way of doing it, which has worked for them in some contexts, is the right way to do it. And so those students also may not improve as much as they could over the course of the semester. Um, the other limitation that is embedded in the Harvard model is that it's based on American legal business culture. And sometimes that's okay because, you know, I'm teaching in an American law school, I'm training my students to operate with an American business legal culture, um, but it doesn't always work. I mean, it's very focused on problem solving, it's very focused on rules, and it's very transactional. And I think students know from their own life that that applies in some contexts, but it doesn't apply in every context. Right? They may have um, relationships at home that they want to negotiate where bargaining over what's fair is beside the point because, um, you know, the whole thing that they're negotiating with is over, um, you know, uh, how their community relates to each other or how they and their brother get along. And, and focusing only on solving the immediate problem in front of you, um, even if you are good at expressing your feelings, like it's missing something. And so what I like is to teach a model that allows for flexibility in choosing which approach you're going to take in a particular context and being more open-minded about having different cultural orientations to negotiation, for example. Question? Yes. What do you think about this model uh, regarding, for instance, uh, the collective bargaining? Mm -hmm. Is it useful? Um, I think the getting to yes model works well in collective bargaining because it exists within the American legal culture. So we have, so it's very transactional. You're working on, you know, what are the terms that we're going to negotiate? There are opportunities for value creation. And so it works really well in that context. And I think one of the reasons that getting to yes works really well in um, collective bargaining is because getting TS is developed partly out of this collective, uh, out of the cultural model of collective bargaining. So, for example, William Urey did, you know, his um, PhD dissertation on a collective bargaining. So, because the American model was influenced by collective bargaining, it makes sense that this model would work reasonably well and be pretty compatible with, you know, American style of union negotiations. Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the, where I see a lot of resistance to this model among my students is the more activist students. Um, and they lately they've had a very strong adverse uh, reaction to difficult conversations because when you're dealing with questions of social justice or injustice or activism, um, or where someone has wronged the community, for example, has engaged in an act of sexism or an act of racism, their view is the conversation that you should be having about this problem is not to sit down and say, well, you know, you did this thing that was racist, but I contributed to the problem by letting you be racist for too long. Like to them, this is not the proper conversation to be having. You know, the proper conversation might be having like, let's, I think you should understand, you know, maybe a restorative justice style conversation. You should understand how you wrong this community and what the impact has. And I don't have any obligation to tell you how I contributed to this problem by being victimized by you, right? So, you know, I think it's, I think it's obvious that no single approach works in every context. And, I, and you know, I think probably the authors of the book would also say they're not advocating that it works in every context. Um, but, you know, it is, I think it's just too easy to get carried away if this is the model you're teaching is to, is to implicitly suggest that this is the only way to do it. Um, and one of the things that I noticed that was really difficult is, um, you know, back in, in, in courses where students are writing journals and they're reflecting on their experiences, if you have a student that, that likes a very assertive bargaining style and they're writing about their assertive bargaining style and why it did or didn't work, what, what sometimes happens is you'll be like, well, this student shouldn't get a good grade because they're obviously not reflecting well on their experiences because they're not adopting the tools of the course. But they may be reflecting perfectly well, it's just that they don't agree with this particular model and how do you grade that? You know, in the typical Harvard model, if they're not agreeing with your model, you they don't do as well in the course. And to me, that seems a little bit unfair as well. Sometimes I avoid those models through mediation in uh, uh, family mm. contests. Mm -hmm. I think to, to, to stress, to highlight some emotional uh, issues, mm -hmm. try, to, try to deal with it in a personal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the other reason why focusing solely on this model doesn't always work is it devalues the experience that students already have. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about negotiation is that students have been negotiating their whole life and they have a broad array of tools and skills that have worked for them over time. And so to suggest at the start of the course that we're starting you from scratch and this is your brand new and you'll learn everything here, um, devalues what they already know when what you would prefer to do is help students build on build on what they already know and develop a, a greater variety of approaches so they have more choices available to them when they are negotiating and uh, i think you also see some of the um limitations of the harvard model um even appearing within harvard so we already talked about the um, difficult Conversations book, that's at the bottom there. You know, I think Manukin's book, Manukin's various work over time, Manukin writes a lot recently about all the times you shouldn't negotiate in various contexts. And I think he has, it's an it's a emotional reaction to his, his feeling that getting to yes doesn't always work. And he's motivated to articulate the context in, it, in which it doesn't work. Um, um, Roger Fisher also wrote a later book with a, a psychologist named Daniel Shapiro on using emotions as you negotiate. And so I think, you know, even Roger Fisher had this notion that his book didn't place enough priority and analysis on emotions. And so he, uh, later in his life, he wrote this book as well with Dan Shapiro. And then of course there's Owen Fiss's whole argument against settlement, um, which we talked about earlier this week. Um, Okay, but the problem with all these responses that were intended to fill the gaps in the Harvard model with like additional three concepts or three things here or seven things here was that it didn't really change the paradigm for thinking about the problem. It was just adding on these little pieces to the ends of the Harvard model um, or offer a counter argument to the Harvard model. Um, and what I really like is that is, is some other approaches that change the paradigm for how to think about negotiation. One of the model, one of the theoretical models that I use throughout my course is from a scholar named Peter Adler. 
And he actually wrote a really short piece that was that's in a collector a, a large um, compiled edition called the Negotiator's Field Book, um, which I highly recommend. So the Negotiator's Field Book is a publication from the ABA. It's this thick, but it's pretty. It's like reasonably cheap. It's like thirty dollars maybe, um, and it has like a collection of three-page articles, four-page articles written by leading scholars in the field. And so if you get that book, you can have a really good sense of where all of, all of the um, scholarship in, in the field is looking right now. So this is one I liked. So he was saying that any particular negotiation and any particular model falls somewhere on this spectrum. So there's a cooperative and competitive model. But what I think is actually really interesting is an additional dimension that he offers of moral versus pragmatic. And at any, any given time, you could think about a, a series of tools or a, a negotiation move as existing somewhere along here. And his, his decision to use the word protean is the idea that good negotiators are flexible, but also that at any given moment, there are many different ways to understand what is happening in a negotiation. And actually, I think there are many different ways to think about where getting to yes resides on this framework. Um, so I guess a question that I'm curious to ask you is, where do you think getting to yes lies on this axis? So maybe talk to your neighbor and then we'll talk about it in a big group. Dictionary.com, shape or shape form, shape shifting. Shape shifting. Okay. I mean, I don't Suggested to Proteus. Ah, oh, Proteus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is the reason why getting to us became so pragmatic? So, central. I think. It's a good book. Yes, it's it's simple and it's easy to understand. This is yeah. It's useful for a large, uh, broad uh, circumstances, uh, possibilities. I think it's probably because it's the only one. So with this characteristics, everybody starts to think that it's the only possibility to really pass. First edition of the book is really just a wonderful book on its own terms because it articulates all this here in a very short, it's like 100, 100 pages long. So, I mean, I think part of it is it's just extremely well executed. So I, I mean, it's, it's a good book on its own terms of just being short, quick, mm -hmm. and clear, persuasive. It's a handbook. Yeah. It? So I think part of it was like the form of the structure. Uh -huh. I used, I used uh, to. They have a, a video. I think it's, uh, it's also getting to yes, the step by step, and it's very repetitive. To summarize the, the idea of getting to yes, it sounds like uh, to me it's like a good type of book, like uh, you know, um, how to become a millionaire in ten. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> clues for being happy and to have the... Ready? Okay. okay, what do you think? <laughs> so where? Mm-hmm. It's okay if you disagree. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Other thoughts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Great. Yes. 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 Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, that's a great point. So there's, so I don't, do you teach this concept called active listening here? Yes. Active listening. Yes. So active listening originated from a psychologist, a therapist mm -hmm. named Carl Rogers. So it, what's really interesting is if you go back and you read Carl Rogers' work explaining what active listening is, because it's the same story. And Carl Rogers hates the way, hated the way that active listening became popularized in culture because he was a therapist. And so his view was that you're not supposed to engage in active listening as a performative act to show the other side that you understand or to make the other side feel good. His theory was that you should engage in active listening as part of a therapeutic process for the other person to understand themselves better and for the other person to grow. And that it did not have like a pra pragmatic purpose. You weren't trying to get anything out of it. It was a relational idea. And that there weren't, in his view there, so, you know, in negotiation we use, we teach a lot of techniques around active listening. And this he found terrible. He thinks having techniques is the antithesis of active listening because the whole point of active listening is that you're building this understanding and relationship so the other person can grow. So it's sort of um, a similar ambiguous state when it comes to getting to yes, because there are respects in which it, you could think of it as truly cooperative, like the orange example, or you could very easily think of the getting to yes approach as a competitive example where you are manipulating the other side into trusting you and to creating value so that you can claim as much value as you want. Um, okay, so Peter Adler also places um, getting to yes on the pragmatic end of the spectrum. That's Peter Adler's argument. Did any of the groups think that the getting to yes model was on the moral end of the spectrum? Yes, okay. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. 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 And and part of what P why I like Peter Adler's model is that you need to you need to have each of these parts all the time and be moving from one to the other. Um it is interesting to me that Peter Adler puts him on the pragmatic scale because I've I feel that if you are talking to Roger Fisher, 
he would actually put it on the moral end of the spectrum because Roger Fisher, Roger Fisher's motivation for writing this book. Now I can't really speak to William Urey cause I, I do not know him really at all, but Roger Fisher's mo motivation to write this book was very moral because, um, Roger Fisher was, uh, fought, fought in world war II as a doing weather reconnaissance. So he would, he would, um, fly in the back of the planes and, and um, figure out what the weather was so that they could report that to the planes that were going to fly. And, you know, I, part of me wonders whether he did the weather reconnaissance for the atomic bomb because he had a lot of guilt around and, and worry and fear about war and the human cost of war. And in his office, he, um, he had a picture of a soldier from Russia that had fought in world war II because he, because, you know, he did a lot of work during the cold war and he wanted to remind himself that, you know, the Russians on the other side of this dispute were real people and that, you know, it is important to avoid, avoid war at all costs because he had remembered the human cost of war. So, I mean, for him, the entire motivation for his entire career, I think was, was about stopping war. And I think he thought this book was a moral effort to, Help he people negotiate. He hmm? he states it. Yeah. He it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He states it in the book, um, and he liked to tell this famous story about. Um, I, I don't think it's. In, I don't think the story is in the book. It might be in the book where um, they were flying in a B fifty two bomber, and they had like a jokester for uh, the pilot was a bit of a jokester. And so the pilot was like, check this out. And he turned off one of the engines and the plane starts going down. And he was like, look, isn't this fun? Like I turned off one of the engines, this is hilarious. And then he turned off the other engine. And then the, the whole plane really starts plummeting and they can't turn it back on because there's no electricity to turn it back on. And the plane is just like plummeting to the ground. And the co-pilot co says to the pilot, boy, do you have a problem? <laughs> but they're all going down in the plane. So this was Roger's, you know, story of like, it doesn't make sense to, to, to say that a negotiation is someone else's problem. Cause you're, you're both in this problem together. So this, the, he was in the plane at the time. The solution to this problem was the engineer realized that, that what they needed was electricity. So he turned a, he turned on like a little generator on the back and got the, um, the, uh, engines running again and they survived and he was able to write this book. Um, so, I mean, I do think it, so one of the reasons I like to use Peter Adler's framework is it's a rem reminder to students that the Fisher model appears everywhere on the graph and that you could use the Fisher model for a cooperative approach. You could use the Fisher model for a competitive approach. You could find a moral part of it. You could find a pragmatic part of it. And I think that it, that helps to explain to students that when they're depending on what they are working on, if they're working on being more assertive, Getting to yes can help them be more assertive. If they are working on listening and empathy, getting to yes can help them be more empathetic. You know, uh, so so it it reminds it reminds students of this sort of neutrality and the flexible use of the model, so that they can pick and choose the parts of getting to yes that will help them be more flexible and more effective negotiators. Okay. Um, so he, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the framework that I use, which is from Andrea Kupfer Schneider. So Andrea Kupfer Schneider is teaches at Marquette University, but she was also um, at the Harvard Negotiation Project for many years, and she co-wrote a book with Roger Fisher as well. Um, but her model is based on her, a study of how lawyers in the United States actually behave. So um, I guess I will provide a disclaimer that. Um, this model that Andrew presents, even though I like it, it's probably also arises from the context of American lawyering. And so it may not always make sense in other cu cultural contexts. And so to the extent that um, it's used in Brazil, like you might need to adapt it to whatever the way that you want to teach your lawyers how to behave. And so, you know, this, again, this is not set in stone. This is one model that she created based on the way American lawyers behave. So she has five different dimensions of skill, which I'll talk about later after the break. Um, and for each dimension of skill, sh students can rate themselves as minimal, average, and best practice so that they can, they can endeavor to improve 
and whatever dimension they're interested in from minimal to average to best. And so he, these are the five skill dimensions um, that she offers to think about the different tools that are important for being an effective negotiator. Should we take a short break? Should we take a short break? I'm just 10. I think we can take a short break. Take a short break? Do you? No? No? Yes? No? How about a short break? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Deal. Okay. I'm going to use my laser point. Oh. Yes. Let me introduce to the president of the Labor Commission of oh, the Policy Bar Association. Oh, Come on. Yes, I think we have time enough there. Just sure. Can I stay here?
Okay, while we are waiting for Freitas, I thought maybe I'd tell you a story. So um, this was one thing that Roger Fisher always liked to say. And uh, it only bothers me in retrospect, but he used to say, um, he used to say, oh, negotiation is like tennis. Because some people, they start out and they're already very good at tennis, or maybe they have trained a lot in tennis, and so they're very good. And some people start out at tennis and they're very bad, but everybody can get better at being a tennis player. So, you know, this analogy sort of works for um, American context because Americans always think they're great at everything. So, you know, Americans might tell themselves, oh, well, I'm one of those people who is naturally good at tennis. And so maybe I can get a little bit better. And maybe you don't think, you might not assume that you're naturally bad at tennis. But the reason I don't like that analogy is because it's like good at what? Because everybody in negotiation is good at something. It's just that the school tools they have might not work in every context. And what they really need to do is not just get better at tennis, but get good, get good at the parts that they're weak at and remain strong for the things they are strong at. And so to me, the tennis analogy is not very precise. And also I kind of disagree about whether someone is naturally good at something because I think you'll find with, and with all the people in your life that each person you know is good, really good at negotiating in some contexts. So you might have a friend who is really good at getting a good deal when they're buying a car, whereas you might have a different friend who is really good at negotiating complex feelings with family members, or you might have another friend who is really good at um, organizing social events, or um, another friend who is really good at negotiating with professors, because our skills work differently in different contexts. Okay, they're coming back. So, I, told, 
I know. I'm sorry. I read that. Yeah. I thought maybe you were waiting for me. I just told them a story. Oh, good. It was not a good story, so it's fine. <laughs> no, the story is finished. It was not a good story. That's hard to read. Okay, so these are the five skill dimensions that Andrea Kufer Schneider has in her um, in her framework. So um, we've talked a little bit about assertiveness. So assertiveness, the way that Andrea so assertiveness in normal speech in the United States usually refers to getting your way, arguing your point, being competitive, and winning. But um, Andrea's definition is more about being very prepared for the negotiation, going into the negotiation with a good with a good alternative or improving your alternative, and then doing a lot of research so that when you're, when you're in the negotiation, you can articulate your point of view persuasively. Um, empathy is to, has two components. One component is a mindset. So one component is being willing to um, hear what the other side has to say. Um, and being open-minded. And the other component is um, being very skillful at gathering information from the other side and also communicating to the other side that you understand and uh, their position really well and have incorporated that information into the way that you are thinking about the problem. Um, flexibility is sort of a related skill and it's related both to empathy and to assertiveness. But flexibility is the idea to change your approach in the middle of the negotiation or to have many approaches available so that you can pick and choose which context to use your approach. Those kind of. Sometimes flexibility may also involve value creation. For, for a lot of these skill sets, value creation is closely associated with flexibility. Um, but also being good at coming up with things in the moment. So for example, the other side will say, I have this criteria that I think is very persuasive. I think we should use market value. And even if market value is not what you think you should do, being good at on the spot saying, coming up with a proposal based on market value, because that's the frame that they want to use. And so being very good at adopting their frame, but still articulating your point of view within their frame of reference. That would be a very high degree of skill and flexibility. Social intuition is about being aware of the emotions and social dynamics and how to respond. So um, you, there are actually two, so in my experience uh, teaching over the last many years, there are actually two different types of students who have trouble with social intuition. Um, and they're not what you would expect. Um, there is, there's the classic person who is not good at social skills. And I don't know if you have these people in Brazil, but these are people who do not understand social skills at all who when they're talking with somebody, they miss all the social cues, they respond inappropriately because they can't read how people are feeling or how they're expressing things. And so they'd say things wrong that offends the other party, not because they mean to, but because they just don't get it, right? So sometimes we have these students, and so these students are working on their social intuition. Because actually, I also noticed that, that these students who lack social intuition have developed very good skills in other areas. So some of my students who are working on social intuition might be extremely strong at assertiveness and empathy and flexibility. So these students might be really good at coming up with persuasive criteria. They also might be very prepared and very good at arguing using the other person's frame of reference and also very good at very willing to understand the other side and very good at articulating the other side. But what happens is their negotiations go wrong because the other person, they make the other side angry because they can't read the social cues. <laughs> Even though their analysis, when you look at their writing and their analysis, best in the class. But when you see their actual negotiations, it goes down the drain because the other side is angry at them. In your experience, uh, is it possible to improve social intuition skills? Maybe? Yes. Yes. The, so the, when these, these students actually, they're, they are not, they, when they work on, the, on skills, they improve over the class. They don't become perfect, um, but um, they improve. I, um, there's another type of student that is also commonly associated with social intuition, and this is less common. Um, sometimes we have students who are very good at noticing social cues and how the other person is responding. And in a way, these students are almost too good because what happens is they're so aware of everything that's happening around them and everything with the other person, they become paralyzed. 
and they're aware of so many different social choices that they can't decide and they're frozen and they just sit there. And so their analysis is really good and their reflection of what's happening and how the other person is behaving is really good, but they just can't choose what to do next. And so there's a lot of video footage of the student just sitting there like looking like paralyzed and disengaged. And so for those students, what they end up having to work on is choosing, choosing what to do because there's, for them, there's too much social information coming in. So those students are very interesting. Um, we also sometimes get students who have a pretty good degree of social intuition, but are very strong in the other measures and want to get even better at social intuition. And those students are very interesting and they become even extremely adept at social intuition in ways that make their agreements and their relationships with others even more amazing. So I, actually social intuition is among the most interesting ones. Um, ethicality is very interesting. So ethicality is of course very important in the United States. I know that's hard to believe, but um, we, <laughs> we have very strong ethical rules that people are expected to abide by, but also, and I wonder if this is maybe true in Brazil as well, your reputation is very important in the American legal community because in the American legal community, it's a small community. And if you have a reputation for being unethical or lying, that can become a big problem and a big challenge to successful negotiations because the other lawyers don't trust you. And maybe the judge doesn't trust you and maybe your clients don't trust you. Um, but it is actually extremely uncommon for students to admit that they have a problem with ethics <laughs> because you might imagine it is not very good to admit to your professor in law school that you are not an ethical person. <laughs> However, it does happen periodically. And so I can tell you a little bit about the students that want to work on ethics. There are some students who might be weak in, others, in, in other areas of negotiation. So they might be a little bit weak in assertiveness and weak on flexibility. And so what they do instead of, of, of coming up with more ways to be persuasive and to work with the other side, they just lie. And they learn over the course of their life that lying to the other side is the best way to get what they want because they're not confident about being able to persuade the other side to do what they want in any other way. And so sometimes you have students who part of their goal in the class is to stop lying and to be better at other ways to persuade the other side and get them to work with them. So that actually has also turned out to be very interesting. But ethicality is uh, more close to the idea of building a reputation than trustworthiness, behaving eth ethically, uh, behaving ethically in a way that uh, behaving ethically in a way that will make you trustworthy. Being, being dependable. And I'm gonna actually provide you even more information than you would ever want on the behaviors associated with each part. Okay, okay, this is very small font. You may not be able to read it. I will just explain what each of them is. So I will go over each skill. And also, did I tell you that I have videos of my students? Did I say that earlier? Oh, so I have videos of my students who are working on different skills that I will show at the end of class you so you can see their Rocky montage of improving over the term. Okay, so this is, oh, this is probably too small to read. So, oh, okay, so take a quick look and then I'll explain a little bit. The goal for these is to try and be as behavioral as possible. So students have a very good understanding of which behaviors they're doing now and which behaviors they want to adopt. So they can be very concrete on how they want to improve and say to me very specifically, today I want to work at doing this bullet point or these bullet points. <clears throat> and um, these um, tables come partly from Andrea's uh, article that I referenced earlier, and but also my students and I have improved it over time. So I'll, at the end of the course, I'll ask the students to make changes to it or suggestions. So this is sort of a, com a, a group project between me, my students, and Andrea's original work. So I'll give you a minute to take a look at this one.
Okay, so what I do at the start of each course is I ask students to rate themselves for each dimension. So I ask them to read these for each skill and circle which one applies to them. Um, and it's generally true that students don't usually start out the course with best practice in every dimension or any dimension really because much of what it means to have a best practice are things they learn how to do and practice how to do in the course. So usually students will start out with a mix of minimal and average practice and maybe one or two best practice. Okay, so especially for empathy, there's two components for empathy. One is their mindset and how they're thinking about the other side. And the other is the overt behaviors they're displaying in the negotiation. So the mindset of empathy with, if you have very minimal practice is you assume you don't care about what the other side actually thinks. You assume they're wrong. You assume that anything they have belongs to you. You're dismissive of their point of view. You have dismissive body language. You're not listening to them. Um, and you discard anything they recommend. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the sort of very low skill level. In the middle, you have a little bit of empathy mixed with a little bit of inattention. So they might listen a little bit if they think it suits them, or they might be a little bit interested, or if the other side says something very persuasive, they might start to listen and be engaged, but it's intermittent. They're only engaged now and then, or they're trying to listen, but it's hard for them, so they listen a little bit and they stop and they start arguing with the other side. Um, they might be able to find a little bit of value creation. They might think ahead of time of a few questions to ask the other side. Um, and they might find a few opportunities to join gains, but you know it only occurs a little bit intermittently. And the best practices are the students start out with a mindset of the other person has something important to them and it's important to understand their point of view and to come up with an outcome that um, addresses the other side's concerns and that the, they might be able to learn something from the other side and that they have many different questioning techniques and listening techniques and they are maintain their ability and willingness to listen even when it's a difficult negotiation and that their, their attempts to listen don't go away during the negotiation. And also a very strong empathy skill set is being able to diffuse the situation where it's becoming escalated. Questions about this one? Okay, here's the assertiveness skill set. And this is even smaller font. Improve your partner and uh, identify partner. Okay. It's in the minimum practice and the best practice. And it's absence in the average practice. Practice. Mm. What is it for me? Oh, the difference between um, improve and identify? Yeah. Difference? Yeah. Significant. Okay. Your badna is what you can do if there is, if there is no good negotiated result. Um, but it is not fixed. So, so much of what getting to yes advocates is doing a better job of research, but improving your BATNA is the idea that before you go into negotiation, making your alternative better, because that's the best way to improve your power at the negotiating table is being better able to walk away. So the most prepared, the best practice is to work on your alternative so that um, you have a strong position. So if you're trying to get a new job, to cultivate a second job offer so that when you're trying to argue for a good salary, you have another offer from another employer already that you can balance. So um, the idea is doing the kind of preparation that gives you a strong BATNA so that you can have an even forceful argument at the table. So the difference between like a minimal level is knowing what your BATNA is and like the best practice would be improving your BATNA. 
just make sure I understood the, mm -hmm. the skills uh, and the first column mm -hmm. should be the, the second column should be added to the skills in the first one. I mean, the average practice should uh, add the first column uh, skills for their different levels. There, it's just it's in between, okay. right? So um, the sort of the students who need to work uh, work on assertiveness are very easy to identify and. Um, usually they identify it in themselves very easily. So these are the students who, when you give them a role play, they never make a counter offer. They just accept what the other side offers right away. These are the students who never say no. These are the students who are very reluctant to speak, who almost say nothing during the negotiation and let the other side talk the whole time. Um, um, these students are, are able to be assertive and aggressive in, in one situation. And that is where they're very close to walking away. So if they have a bottom line, like they cannot afford to accept less than, you know, $3,000 for a car, they become very assertive when the amount the party is willing to pay is $3,001. Then they finally discover their assertiveness skill and they say, no, absolutely, I can't do that. And they think, oh, I'm such a great negotiator. Well, it's because you're, all, you have to, you're almost at having to walk away. And that's, you know, that's, it's not a sign that you're better at being assertive, it's a sign that you are about to walk away. Um, but that it's a place to start, right? So, and these students also set their ass, have very low goals. So if they, if they can only sell their car for $3,000, they might set a goal of selling the car for $3,100. It's a very low goal. Whereas students who are strongly assertive might come up with an ambitious goal for what to ask for their car and come up with a very good justification for why they deserve $4,000 to sell their car. Um, you can see that um, most of what we would consider to be best practices are involve a lot of research ahead of time, preparing difficult questions for the other side, coming up with strong um, independent criteria, coming up with packages for negotiating at the end of the day, um, coming up with a specialized preparation method, finding ways to create value, um, preparing your client for difficult outcomes. Um, and then you see sort of in the middle is, you know, sometimes they are able to do that, sometimes they don't, and maybe they haven't done very much research. Questions? Okay. Here is flexibility. Um, so flexibility is an interesting skill set. Um, flexibility is your ability to change your approach in the negotiation to, and to be aware of the different opportunities to change your approach and to change your frame of reference so that you can discuss the problem in the way the other side wants to discuss them. Flexibility is also the ability to identify hardball tactics. Is this a term? What's the term for hardball tactics? Oh, um, like hardball tactics, like strategy, like Trump style tactics. <laughs> what would you call those? So your ability to identify Trump style tactics and have a good witty response or a strong response to when you're negotiating with some, like a Trump style person using dirty tricks. That would be a good example of flexibility. Um, so I think of flexibility as like a gateway skill for people who need to work on empathy. Because what happens is the students who need to do a better job of empathy and listening they don't want to, they don't start out in the class thinking, you know, I need to be a better listener. Because if they had that kind of awareness, they wouldn't be in that situation in the first place. However, these students who are very bad at listening and very bad at empathy are usually able to identify that they have a problem with flexibility. And what they tell themselves is, my problem is not that I don't care about the other side, it's that maybe I need to be more flexible. And so often what we see at the start of the course is these students who have very low empathy, they start out by saying, what I want to work on is flexibility. And that's probably true. And they do work on flexibility. But it's not uncommon for students to start out saying, I want to work on flexibility, and then switch to working on empathy when they discover over the course of the class that uh, the other students do not like them and, and uh, they're bad listeners. But uh, flexibility can also be a helpful um, approach in other contexts. Um, you know, there are just some students who um, are who th these students uh, sometimes are very prepared. So sometimes you see students who have a high level of preparation and planning who are good at assertiveness because they're very prepared. 
but what but they are unwilling to deviate from their plan in the negotiation and that's where it becomes hard well they where they say i want to use this criteria this is the best criteria this is fair this is what we must do and when the other side says that's not what i want to do they freeze and that and so maybe they might freeze and give in or maybe they might freeze and get more and more angry and more more obstinate and this and the situation escalates and so those are the students who need to be work on flexibility. When the other side says, I don't want to do that, they can come up with a different way to achieve their goal. So those are the students who need to work on flexibility. Questions about that? Okay, social intuition, we talked about this a little bit. Um, and I do think that this one is a little bit easier because Students who need to work on this usually identify this right away because they have noticed in their life that this is a problem for them. And I think what the, what, one reason why this um, framework is nice is because it offers a set of behaviors that they can work on. Because they might know that they have a problem with social skills, but they might not have a pathway to get there. And so it's nice to give them some ideas for how to do that. Like, having a good first impression or managing silence so that it's not awkward or focusing on the facial expressions of the other side and paying attention to it. One of the, one of the things that students sometimes have trouble with is they don't look at the other person they're negotiating with. And so they miss all of the cues because they're looking down. And so one of the things they sometimes work on is just gathering the information they need to interpret and watching the other side rather than distracting themselves by looking at the paper or thinking about other things. And then of course these are for part of the ethicality metric is also so that every all the students learn how to be more ethical um i've also started to include in ethicality questions of bias and discrimination and being more aware of the respects in which um you know bias operates in the workplace and operates in the legal profession and being better able to identify it and respond to it and address it in the moment. So some of ethicality is skill sets really for everybody to work on. And so we do spend some weeks for on everybody working on being more ethical. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's a good idea. We don't cover that in this course, but I think it would be a good idea. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's one example. Yes, that's one example. Yeah, that's one example for sure. Yep. And one of the interesting things about Andrea's research is she found that the best negotiators in her study were very flexible and that they would notice the social context and notice when they needed to be more competitive and when they needed to sit back and be more empathetic and that every negotiator that she observed who was very skillful, used a variety of these skills at all times and shifted from one skill set to another depending on what that negotiation needed at that particular point in time. So part of what I'm trying to train my students to do is to be to, to feel confident enough to use all different tools when they need them and to have practice if they feel like they're lacking in assertiveness, to have practice being assertive so that when they need to be assertive, they can be, even if most of the time they want to be empathetic. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit. Um, so at the start of the course, students rate where they are on the chart, and then they choose which skill they wanna work on. And sometimes they change their mind and that's okay. Sometimes they switch skills. Um, they also develop a buddy in class who is their coach. And usually what they do is they find a coach in the class who is someone who has different skills from them. So someone who needs to work on empathy might decide to have a coach who's really good at empathy 
And that often works well because usually the student who needs to work on empathy is good with assertiveness and teaches the other student how to be more assertive. And so together they work on building, they get the advice from the, from the students that have the complementary skill set. And then throughout the course, we offer theoretical skills that can be used in many different ways, right? So like I said earlier, the getting to yes approach can be used for all different students depending on what skill they're working on. And then they have many simulations and opportunities to decide specifically what they want to work on, record how well they're doing. And then <clears throat> I actually require my students to watch their negotiations on their laptop every night to see how well they're doing and to come up with a plan for the next day's negotiations so they can have a specific strategy for how to improve. And so they're collecting the feedback of watching themselves negotiate to try and assess where they are. Um, I have found in my experience that when students do not record their negotiations, they have a very biased view of how it went. So, so when I first started teaching, students did not record their negotiations and the stories they would tell me never added up because they would come back and they would say, oh, my negotiation went terrible. The other side was a jerk. I was the best. And if I had, maybe if I had a different person to negotiate with, everything would have been great. But, you know, the other students in this class, they are very flawed. And then, of course, the other student in the negotiation would say, that's not true. You were a jerk. You were horrible. And I was the best. And I never did anything wrong. And they would never learn anything because they didn't get feedback. They didn't have to be confronted with feedback about what actually happened in the negotiation. Objectively, um, all they had was their own report, and I couldn't really help them because I hadn't seen the negotiation. All I have is their story, their self-serving story that they tell. So one of the things we also do in class is I will ask them to uh, watch their video and make a little bit clip that illustrates a concept from the class. And then we'll watch it in the class all together and talk about what happened in the negotiation. Questions? So here's some examples of, this is um, sort of theoretical, of how students rate themselves. And I'll give you some examples of students. This is sort of constructed based on a bunch of students. So here's how a student might rate themselves at the start of the course. So this would be a very typical type of thing where a student, this is a student who is very empathetic but is not very assertive at all and probably also not very flexible but they are very focused on relationships, social intuition, and they're perfectly ethical. So you can see, you, can, you might imagine what this student wants to work on. Usually this student says, my goal is to be a best practice at assertiveness. You know, these students have been developing these skills over their whole lifetime, so it's actually very hard to get them from a minimal place to best practice, but sometimes you can move them from minimal to average and sometimes a little bit of best practice. But the important thing is that they improve. Like cross-rating each other? I mean, no, they rate themselves I and mean, then they talk to each other. I mean, part of why I like this is it's self-directed. I'm never going to tell the student, this is what I think you need to work on because who am I to say what they know themselves better than anyone and they, they know what they want to work on. So I, when they say they want to work on this, I say, sure, it's up to you. They talk to their coach and the other student might say, you know, everyone has an opinion, but they ultimately, it's up to them. Um, so this is an example of a student who um, thinks they need to work on flexibility because they rate themselves average and empathy at the start of the course. But that the reason they rate themselves average is because they don't really have a good understanding of empathy. And so they overestimate how good they are and they think what they need is flexibility. And so at the start of the course, they say, I just want to work on flexibility. But they're, probably they might be wrong. And that's because of this something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Are you familiar with this at all? People use this a lot when they make fun of Trump. Uh, so this is, this is the idea that people with the highest degree of confidence about a particular metric probably are the ones with the least skill. And the most confident you ever are about how good you are at something is when you have a tiny, tiny little bit of competency. And that is where when your confidence is at its very highest. But as you gain competency, you become start to realize all of the things you don't know. And so your confidence plummets as your knowledge and experience goes up. And, the, and even once you become an expert level, your confidence is never quite as high as it was when you knew almost nothing. Because even experts are aware of the things that they still need to know. And so what happens with students, 
uh, who might need to work on empathy is they start out thinking they're pretty good at it. And the more they learn about empathy during the course, the more re they realize they're bad at it. And so then they switch uh, what they want to work on. They revise their assessment down and say, well, actually, I'm actually more here on empathy. And so my goal is to be amazing at, a, at empathy. So this, this they, they might shift their assessment over time. Okay, I thought maybe I would share with you um, some videos from my students. Um, I, my students generously agreed to share these with you. Um, but one of the things that's hard is the videos contain students from the whole class who they're negotiating with. And so I had to get permission from each student who appeared in the video, which is a lot of students. So some of the students I was not able to get in contact with. So I blurred them out in the video. So if you see a student that has been blurred out, it's because they, I, you know, I wasn't able to get permission from them to be in the video. But most of the students you'll see aren't blurred out. Okay, um, it's hard to choose which one to start with first. Do you, want to, do you want to see a student who's working on empathy or assertiveness first? Oh, really? Okay. Oh, well, this, oh so that you might recognize this student. Well, Freitas might recognize this. This is one of the students who visited Brazil. Her name is Belaine. Um, okay, hold on. Wait, I wanted to open a different one. Uh, oh, here we go. So, Ray, do that. That's okay, hold on just a sec. So, I'll try and give you a little bit of context around this. Negoti I wonder, do you think it needs to be louder? Or is it okay? How do you feel about the volume? Okay. So, these captions are captions that she made in her video. This is her final assignment. That is Belaine on the far right. And these are the students she's negotiating with. So, this is a simulation involving four authors who are arguing about the book, uh, book royalties. And she's saying, I didn't do very much work, but the ideas were mine, and so I deserve 10 or 15%. And the other ones are saying, you didn't do any work, you deserve nothing. So this is her example of a baseline clip. So this is her example of bad skill. So she's saying, this is how I was at the start of the course. I was very bad at this. Here are examples of me demonstrating a poor level of empathy. So we didn't do. We didn't do anything. We only talked about it. We so, start. We start working on that, and that's why we had the email exchange that you never responded. No, I didn't. If I didn't send it back, we didn't work on it. All you did. Oh was, yeah, of course. Yeah, you just got my ideas and gave it to somebody else. Yeah, that's what I, we did. I didn't you listen to on that part by yourself. Yeah. I didn't listen to the email. Okay. Uh, voicemails. I think my roommate did, and that was all. Oh, well, now it. you never got it, but now your roommate got it. If, so you got to clarify. I mean, you say the truth because it's for lack of respect to them to not just come in with two different stories now. Well, if someone heard it and it wasn't me, it had to be my roommates. And outside of that, I, I, can't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah. But I didn't get anything well, from you. I'm telling you, what I would like to is first look at the script mm -hmm. and go through this. And we could go through the maps too. So Alex. you can identify what Alex, 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 Alex. Otherwise, I want 25% of what they're offering you. 25%? Yeah. Alex. No. <laughs> That's so what do you observe from this clip? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else do you observe? Hmm? Yeah, she's being sarcastic. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Try and. Okay, so here's an example where she's improving a little bit. So I want you to watch and see if you can notice the respects in which she's a little bit improved. That's one for uh, for lot two thirty four. I'm willing to negotiate a little further price on lot two thirty two. How do we turn up the volume on this? Maybe this one. Ah. Okay, let's try that. Uh, even though it is smaller, but yeah, for two thirty four, I don't see myself. You know. Mm hmm. This is a negotiation over real estate. 
Wait, so 234, the larger lot, you want to lock in, but you're flexible in the smaller lot? Yes. Okay. Um, so why um, do you think we can we can get um, maybe, I don't know, maybe, uh, but why it's expensive? I would like to like ask you some, some reasons because, why? for example, what we can be able to pay for this, it's about like 30 thousand dollars no 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 for just the 232 maybe less like 25 because it doesn't have a curve cut so yeah. we're gonna have to do some investment on that um to get a, a parking lot there okay so what did you observe in that one hmm no she was uh, calculating numbers on her phone <laughs> Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah, she's, uh, yeah. Language, yeah. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You can see she's still struggling a little bit with the skill. So you notice she asks a question, which is good. It's great that she asks a question, but then she doesn't give him a chance to answer, right? She asks it and then she starts arguing, right? But it's progress, right? Because she, she reminds herself to ask a question, um, even though, you know, she can't execute it perfectly and give him the space to answer. So here's, um, this is her, another example of, of, progress that she notes um, where she's trying to do a better job of having a mindset of being interested in the other side and gathering information. This is um, where they are two parties in a company and they're negotiating over resources in the company. Yeah, but yeah, the firing range is open during those times. Um, so yeah, I guess on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Oh no, sorry, they're neighbors, they're neighbors that don't get along. So there are two businesses. One of them has a gun shop and the other one has a meditation shop. So you can imagine they don't really get along. So they're trying to figure out a way that they can both be neighbors. Yes. To try and work something out because our hours for firing range and your hours seems to be overlapping. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you had any complaints before? No, actually, you're the first tenant that's given complaints. Do you have, uh, what type of soundproof system do you have? Um, currently, I mean, we didn't have neighbors um, that were really near us, so we, we didn't receive complaints. So we don't have a lot of soundproofing mm -hmm. um, just because we never really needed it. Um, but we could look into soundproofing cost and see kind of what would be feasible. Yeah, maybe what we can do, it's like, I don't know if any of your clients have experience due to the activities uh, with, with dance and all that. Uh, they have had experienced some soundproofing or, or they can do it for like a cheaper cost. That's I don't true. know. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could look into that, definitely. I think that's something that... I was doing feasible. some research and the soundproofing, it's about... Um, it can go from $850 to $1,700. Okay, so that's why I was thinking that maybe one of your clients have experienced a cheaper soundproofing system. Yeah, I can look into see if a client does, and then if not, um, I mean, depending on what we decide from here, that might be worth the cost. Yeah, yeah. Check with client. For better rate. Okay, cool. So what did you observe in that clip? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. One of the things you can also notice from the clip is she has engaged, she has used preparation to help herself. So you can see she sat ahead of time and she thought to herself, 
okay, maybe soundproofing on the other side is something that might work or save money. Let me research how much it costs. And here's a question that I want to ask the other side to gather information. So she's prepared in a way that has made her more curious about the other's point of view. And then she asks them that. And then unlike the other clip, she gives them time to answer. So here's the last clip from hers. In this clip, um, yeah. Oh yeah, because otherwise they won't both be in the video frame. So I told the students, this is artificial and you have to sit closer than you want so that you're both in the video and you're both kind of facing the video. So that's why it's, or otherwise it's not a very interesting video to watch. So I made them sit like this, both facing the camera. One of the things also that I've noticed recently, which is very new and might be like a generation Y thing, is you see the students will sometimes look at the camera. Like they're aware that they're being filmed and that they're, the audience is the person watching, not the person they're negotiating with. And especially if the other side is being unreasonable, sometimes they'll go like this and like look at the camera. Like, don't you want to look at this? Look at what I'm having to deal with. So this is, this is new. This is a Generation Y thing. So uh, here's Belaine. In this scenario, she is the boss. And this student is um, complaining, this is there at a video game company, and this student is complaining that she was discriminated against on her gender and mistreated by the other video game workers and that she is underpaid relative to the male video game workers. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I first wanna start out with that, I felt like a lot of the uh, critiques that I got about it from the other managers, mm -hmm. they weren't, constructive mm -hmm. at all. A lot of them were like the boring and they wanted it to be realistic but when I spoke to the marketing department they did the research on what a realistic poker kind of aspect would be and that's not the usual smoke and girls and drinks that um, the, the, the team of the managers wanted me to produce so I went with what the marketing people said and I created a more um, family atmosphere environment. And then I just got torn to shreds in the reviews. And I recently found out that um, Scott is taking over the casino game. Or you okay. to it. Yeah, let's go through parts. So yeah. first of all, you talk to the marketing department about, you know, how to or the target for this, what would be the best. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, I'm concerned about the project. It's like, can you explain to me about the target audience that you pick for the casino game? Like, under what uh, argument arguments you pick that you pick that target family oriented? Yeah, we picked family oriented because yeah. So, what did you observe in that one? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, one of the things that's interesting about these clips is you know, the students, how do I get back to this screenshot? The students never end up being perfect at the skill. So, like, so, you know, the clip we saw is not perfect because, um, and, and one of the reasons is this particular negotiation was very challenging because the boss's instructions basically said, this employee is very bad and this employee should not have done marketing research because they went over your head. They should have talked to the boss first before talking to marketing. So if you go back and watch the clip, what you see is she's saying, I was mistreated by the other employees because when I talked to marketing, they said my way was better. And the boss's instructions make the boss very tempted to say, you shouldn't have gone to marketing, you were wrong, this whole thing happened because you did this thing that was not authorized. So you can see that it is very hard for her to hear the other side talking about marketing without interrupting and without lecturing. So you can see she's trying to stop herself from saying like what you did was wrong and is trying to listen, but it's very difficult for her. And then she starts to say, 
well, I saw you went to marking and here's the thing I'm about to explain. And then she catches herself and then asks a question. And it's not the best question. She says, you know, what is your marketing idea? And you can tell she's already a little bit angry and it's not the best question. But what's good is she realized she was getting angry and starting to lecture and she stops herself and she says, okay, I'm just gonna ask a question. <laughs> and she asks a question so she interrupts, she interrupts her tendency to wanna start to arguing. So it's not like the best empathy skill, but it's a good contrast from the start of the clip where she felt like arguing, she was very worked up, she starts to argue. In this one, she's starting to get worked up, she notices it and interrupts herself and asks a question instead. And gives, and gives the other person space to talk even though she disagrees. So you can see like, this, you know, the students are struggling with their natural tendencies and trying to work towards something better. Um, do you wanna see another one? Okay. So here is a student who is working on assertiveness. Uh, the opening okay. for the lead. So this is kind of a funny story. Okay. So the student who's working on assertiveness is the woman. Um, for the lead. And he sees. Okay. She's working on assertiveness. Uh, this student, this is at the very first day of class or the second day of class. She's working on assertiveness. That, that student is the most assertive student in the entire class. Mm -hmm. And they're negotiating. Oh, she represents an opera singer and they're negotiating over um, how much the opera singer will be paid. Um, but the secret information, which actually everybody knows in the negotiation, is that this opera just lost their star because their star is sick. And all they have is a secondary person who is not experienced. And her client is very experienced. So order, ordinarily in this negotiation, both sides are very motivated to come to a deal and the deal is usually pretty good for both sides. But this particular student has experience in the actual music and opera industry. And so, which makes him even more assertive. And so instead of offering to pay a reasonable fee, he said, well, he, you'll watch him say, we don't really want your client. And in fact, we're only gonna make her an offer for the secondary role for not very much money. And it's very surprising because I've actually never seen this happen where they only offer the secondary role as a way to get the money down. So you can see she becomes very startled and nervous when he says, you know what? Secondary role is fine with us. We don't really care. Seemed very inclined for her to take the lead because she does have the experience playing the role, whereas your secondary person um, does not have the experience and, um, from what I understand, does not quite have the skills to take on that lead role. Um, and so we, I mean, ideally, we would like to have Sally be in that lead role for that. What I'm a little bit concerned about is that this normal role, she, it, this, this first role, um, needs a, based on the age, we need a new star. He's saying your client is too old. We need a new face. We she, I mean, very much wants the lead role. So mm -hmm. we would be negotiating for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, obviously, it's, um, uh, obviously, she would want at least her last salary, but possibly more because there has been inflation over time. Mm -hmm. um, and traditionally, the the lead role takes you know twice as much as the secondary role. And so, mm -hmm. um, from including uh, inflation and whatnot, I think we are hoping for. Um, Ideally, we would like to have somewhere around like the $28,000 range, which is an increase from what she did last year because of the inflation, which was her you know, secondary role. Mm -hmm. um, but also knowing that, um, you know, she is stepping in at the last minute. <laughs> what are some so what did you observe in that clip? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, anything else? Yes, yes, yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Right. So yes. Yes. So part of helping students be more assertive is helping them prepare so that they have more confidence when they go into the negotiation to argue for what they want or to change strategy if it doesn't work. So what this student said is that, like you observed, the student said she felt very nervous during this negotiation. She became very, she said she became very flustered when he said they only want the secondary role. She said that she became very red and this was embarrassing to her and that her, and, um, and that she was stammering a lot. Um, you know, which is funny because sometimes students who are working on assertiveness, like they say almost nothing in the negotiation and they're very quiet. But other students, other students when, who are working on assertiveness, they just talk, 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 and they feel nervous. And the more nervous they are, the more they talk, and the other person doesn't say anything and just waits for them to make concessions, which is what you saw Korea doing in this case. So, you know, needing to work on assertiveness comes in many forms. So it, come, it could come in you know, sort of dominating and talking a lot. So um, this is an example of um, progress clip of her doing a little bit better. So I, I think this one, they're also negotiating over a contract. Um, and this, I think, is also challenging for her because um, mo almost all the students in these clips are master's students in conflict resolution. But this particular student she's negotiating with used to be a lawyer. So it's a little bit intimidating for her to negotiate this contract with the lawyer, but she's trying to be more confident and more calm and more prepared in negotiating the terms here. It's like your top three to five priorities, like what's super important to you? I think definitely the sound is like the biggest priority because that is, it interferes with the conflict. Oh, sorry, this is, this is the neighbor, the gun and the meditation retreat, yeah. That's what this one is. So that would be the biggest thing. I think also, um, you know, I've noticed that out front, there's just um, a lot of, uh, like a lot of mess, especially from, you know, the smokers. But, but then uh, I think also parking is um, something that my clients have complained a lot about is not having spaces to park. Um, so I think those would kind of be like the top priorities for me. Okay. Just, um, my concern with is, um, so, just you know, finances uh, obviously, yeah. and creating a profit um, is also the fact that, like I, especially if we if we can't find an alternative for well, each of us using at the basement at the same time, um, I would probably need to invest in some soundproofing, and that would take a lot of money. And so, um, so I'm definitely interested in looking into the security option, but my resources. Um, yeah. If I have to spend a lot of money to soundproof, like then I won't have as so, much resources. Yeah. Well, towards security. Is being in the basement, doing a shooting range in the basement, an ideal scenario for you? Um, it's actually not completely necessary okay. for us. Um, well, I might be able to help with that actually because oh. <laughs> um, so that's why I was wondering was uh, because I actually have a piece of land that I am hoping to eventually turn into a retreat center on the weekends, and so that my clients on the weekends can go out and have you know a weekend yoga retreat. And okay, so what did you observe in this one? Mm hmm. Well, well, she is, but she's doing their clips of the negotiation. So she's editing. So usually the students do this. They edit out the clips of the other person talking. So she's, she might not be talking as much as it appears. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So she's not rambling as much. Her her speech is more concise. Here's one. Here's two. Here's three. She's speaking more slowly in a more measured way. You can see she's not all red and excited. She's sort of a little bit calmer. So, you know, is it the best? No. But you can definitely see a contrast from the start to this clip. Okay, and then this clip, okay. 
This clip, one of the, so this clip you can see she's on the same side as her adversary at the start. So part of what makes this a little bit easy for you or for her is that her partner is the most assertive negotiator. So she knows if something goes wrong, her very assertive partner will step in and say something aggressive. So I think that's also part of why she's she's a little bit more confident in this one. Um, but let's watch it and and see what you think. It's also he's sharing the space, and so it's just looking for a place to where he can have his own space and um, do his own thing. So uh, he's looking at some different properties and. How, I'm, I'm not quite sure how he found Amy's property, but found it and really liked it. And so wanted to talk about the possibility of um, purchasing it if mm -hmm. we can come to an agreement. Okay. So I'm curious why you're, you're intrigued into his other situation versus like the property here and what he's wanting. I'm just curious to see kind of why he's looking to move into it, what his needs might be related to it, why this property is looking uh, like it might be more ideal for him and what needs he might have with relocating to this property. I think it's ideal because it's a um, it's a property that he would be so, the sole occupant of and you know the building has the this you know enough room that he could create um, a grade three kitchen which he needs in order to operate his business um, and yeah and so I think that's really the main thing is just being the sole occupant okay. and, and having those facilities, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly like I think he likes, um, you, you know, this property in particular because there's the extra space to potentially have a parking lot as well with a couple spaces in it so he can, you know, have his catering van there mm -hmm. um, next to it. So. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think we've done the estimates that renovations would run roughly $16,000 um, and equipment would run about $32,500. Amy's not wanting to, she wants to sell as is, not do renovations. I mean, there's potential. Okay. It's not an either or. I mean, there, there are, it depends on what the price would be. Can you give us a minute yeah. maybe to confirm and kind of figure out like yeah. what Chuck might be willing to offer for all of that. Okay, cool. We'll be right back. Sorry, that took so long. There's lots of elements certainly to this. Lots of things to consider. Okay, so I think we looked at what Chuck might be willing to do and, um, you know, looked at possibly, like, the cost of the two lots together mm -hmm. um, and went on. And then... Um, okay, so what did you observe in this one? She's more confident. This was a very combative negotiation because this um, negotiation had no zone of possible agreement. So there, so in this particular negotiation, there was no way for the parties to reach a deal unless one of them violated their instructions. So part of what's going on is this is structurally difficult compared to the first one. So you can see her skill level is a little bit enhanced over the first one. It's not like perfect, but it's a much more difficult negotiation. And you can see, you know, she's asking a few questions to the other side, whereas in the original one, she wasn't asking any questions. She was just rambling. So even if she's rambling a little bit here, she stops herself and then she asks a question, a difficult question of the other side to force them to respond. And she'll say, this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. You know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's a higher skill level at a more greater difficulty level in this negotiation. One of the challenges of this, of this particular course that you're watching right now is that it is offered in a very condensed time frame. So this course was only offered over like 18 days or something. And so it was like, you know, three hours a day, four hours a day for 18 days. And the problem is it's a small period of time for students to improve their long-term behavior. So you actually, in this course, you don't see as much of a of improvement as you do for a course that lasts an entire semester. Because what often happens is for a, a semester long class, students will work on their skill outside of class when they're negotiating with their family and their friends and their classmates, and they have extra time to reflect and to practice the skill. 
So no, so nor ordinarily in a semester long class, you see a much greater progress over time than here. They, it's just super intense. Okay, I have one last set of clips to show you. Also, this particular negotiator who you'll see in the next clip is also one of the toughest negotiators in the class as well. What were some of the other prices? Okay, so it, uh, this clip belongs to this woman right here named Katie. And she's very assertive. And she, I think she, I recall, she might have also been working on flexibility. This particular student is the opposite. This student was working on empathy. Or, or sorry, this person was working on assertiveness. This person was working on empathy. And so it's an interesting combination of someone who's very assertive, sort of steamrollering over the person who's not assertive at all. And the, actually, the next clip I'm going to show you is the same people at the end of the course. And you can see in the next clip that her assertiveness skills are much better and her empathy skills are much better. So, but here's the original baseline story where you can see, this is, I think, the first day of the course, where you can see she's asking these very combative questions to this person who's not very assertive. Neighborhood. So what we saw was around 160, okay. um, 170. Okay. And that's, that's a little outside of our budget range, even mm -hmm. at, that, at that level. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how much you might be able to come down from your price point. Mm -hmm. um, are, there, are there any things that you're looking for in terms of helping with the transition to having your mother-in-law as part of the household? Like, are you there any um, I don't know, furnishings or things like that? There might be a possibility mm -hmm. to um, make some accommodations and then help with that price? Are there other factors that you're looking at with cost? Well, what we are going to need to do is a new equipment um, and now my budget. Oh, actually, this is, that's a different scene. Um, okay, so what did you observe in that clip? Yeah, how did you notice she's tough? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the context of that negotiation was they were negotiating over selling an apartment. And if you look at the specific words that she chose, she said, well, I think we can do 160. And then the question she asked to the other side is, is there anything you can do to come down from your number, right? So the framing of it is, this is your problem. Is there anything you can do to fix this problem? And then they, there was a fact pattern where they had to borrow money for their mother-in-law or their mother-in-law. They had to borrow money from their mother-in-law, but also the mother-in-law lived with them, which was an awkward fact. So you can notice in the clip, she references the mother-in-law. So she says, oh, well, you know, what do you need to do? You know, I know that your mother-in-law lives with you. Like maybe that you can help yourself get away from your mother-in-law or whatever. <laughs> so you can tell she finds the most difficult, embarrassing fact for the other side and then like highlights it in her face. Okay, so here's another clip where th this student was actually working on a, uh, being more assertive. And again, this student is working on listening more. It's down to about 75,000. Um, wow. And in addition to, yeah, because, because we've been cut and need to meet payroll and these other research obligations for the Department of Defense. Um, so that's one restriction that I'm coming to the table with now. Um, also, I know we, we came to some agreements about shared staffing before, and I, I just heard that because of these security issues, we can't actually collaborate on staffing or have any other staff people in our lab. So here's a little bit of the context is this negotiation was very difficult, where this person had to convey to the other side that her department can't help them at all. So this is very hard for her because she's working on assertiveness. And here she's saying this difficult thing like, I want you to understand that like, we can't help you at all. And then everything you, you need to make all the changes for us and there's nothing we can do. So you can see she's having trouble getting the words out of her mouth because this is like so difficult for her. Um. So I'd love to explore what other options we have, but first do you want to share with yeah. me your restrictions? So, I mean, I, if I can't have the, how do you meet me halfway on cost, like the only ways that I can really make that up are with use of lab space or with personnel. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So if those restrictions are in place, I... 
Well, there, it's a restriction on who can be in our lab, mm -hmm. not not what of right, our, your lab of our has staff. Right, more like technologically advanced lab, and we would really benefit from having that lab space. So that would be how we would then maybe negotiate um, from the point of having the. Um, the well, there's also great. There's also the possibility of, of having some of my employees work in your lab, even if it takes a little bit longer, on okay. having them help with your your synthesis. Okay, um, that would that would be better because like my my employees actually like my best employees ended up going to work for you, um, mm -hmm. and I never. So, what do you observe in that one? Yes. I mean, you know, as you can see how, you know, we develop our skill, our negotiation skills over a lifetime, and it's just really, really hard to change. So you can see how she's struggling to change. So she's telling her this very difficult news. And it's progress that instead of saying something rude right away, she's like, okay, I'm thinking, I'm listening, this is difficult. And then she conveys, well, I want you to know this is difficult. And then and this is a constraint for me. And then she, you then notice she stops and thinks, right? So that's a good sign that you can tell she's stopping to thinking about what the other person said and is trying to incorporate it into her point of view and trying to incorporate it into potential options that she's thinking about. So like there's a little moment there where you can tell she's at least thinking about what to do, but then she can't help herself but say something rude at the end because like she's so good at coming up with like good verbal jabs. She can't help it that she's like, Oh, I want to remind you, you stole my best employees, but you know, I'm still, I'm still finding a way to work with you. Yeah. So that was great. So I, I, anyways, I really appreciate the students being willing, you know, to share these videos with you because you are kind of personal. And so, but I think they wanted to share what they've learned with, um, with you all. So they were willing to for their videos to be shown. So those are all the clips I have. And so I'm ready to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. Right, that's sort of the message we're trying to send for that particular simulation. So one of the things we teach our students is you have to have a very good understanding of what your alternative is. And so the purpose of that simulation is for them to prepare very well in advance. Because in that simulation, both sides have a very good alternative. And what happens sometimes is they get so caught up in the person in front of them that they forget that the other deal they have is really extremely good. And so the purpose of that exercise is for them to remember and prepare for the fact that their alternative is very good and not just take a deal that's worse because the person is right in front of them and the social pressure of trying to make a deal. So it's part of reminding students that your preparation is very, and understanding your alternatives is very important, even if you're trying to create value and do your best to be flexible. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do think for many students, the biggest barrier they have to improvement is their mindset, which is why I, the course gives them every opportunity to think about what their mindset is. And one of the things that's also discouraging for students is, you know, everybody comes into the course with a series of negotiation skills that works very well for them in their everyday life. And so when I ask them to work on a skill that's not as good for them, what they find is at the start of the class, their, their overall negotiation skill level goes down 
because they're having to rely on skills and tools that they don't nor or normally use in their everyday life. And it's hard for them because they get worse at negotiation at the start of the class. But the idea is to pull up that part of your skill set that's weak so that when you leave the class, you can use the skills you already have that are strong and also have the option of using the ones that are better and overall have more tools. But it's very frustrating to be in a negotiations class and seeing yourself getting worse. Uh, but I try and promise the students that by the end, they'll have more choices about how they negotiate. No more questions at all? OK. No, go ahead, go ahead. We'll show, briefly, but go ahead. <laughs> Okay. Uh mm -hmm. Framing. Yes, that's called framing. Yep. Mhm. Mm Mm -hmm. Yes, because there's three. <laughs> yeah, you forgot the third because the third was not necessary. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with that, Professor, but I'll check it out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I know. No. Um, I, st I think it's sometimes discouraging for students because the course is so condensed that many students will say, I didn't improve very much and I'm sad that I didn't improve as much as I wanted to improve. And what I try to tell them is, you have your whole life to improve, right? And so now you know what you wanna work on. The thing that matters the most in the videos is that they have a good analysis of what's going on so that they can say, you know, if this student up here, like I was happy with the way I stopped and listened, even though I made a witty remark at the end, you know, I stopped and asked myself a question. And so then they're aware of the progress they make and they have a plan for themselves for improving over time after the course is over. So, I mean, I, they do get discouraged, but I think they don't get want to give up because they have to get a grade at the end of the course. But I think it I do think it's hard and some of them I think struggle with making the final project and I it is very challenging I think and stressful for them. Yes. Oh, the profession, like the market. Mm. Oh, no, I mean, mostly not. I mean, he, the thing is, um, you know, almost all cases in the United States are settled in some way. So American lawyers have to negotiate as part of their jobs. And, you know, some of them have been more formally trained than others. So part of this is to give them a framework for thinking about it in practice. Um, although these particular students are not lawyers, they're master's students in ADR. So this, these students actually will go into a profession where, where negotiating and mediating might be their primary role. But for most of the students that we teach in law school, it's a generalized skill that they use throughout practice. I mean, most of the time students will say, oh, this course was so helpful because I negotiated with my roommate who was a jerk and who never did the dishes. And then I called the phone company and they were overcharging me and I got $10 back and I was so happy and I didn't realize I could negotiate with the phone company. 
So most of the stories they have are about their personal life because they're still students, but it, it's intended to be used more broadly in their profession, whatever profession they choose to go into. You're close to the session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Lise. Yes. My uh, we're going to meet uh, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., and we'll be the, the last. The last one, yes. The last one, the last lecture, unfortunately, for this time. <laughs> for this time. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.